Well, I guess we can get started. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our today's lecture. It's my great honor to introduce uh, James Trafford from the University for the Creative Arts in Epsom. Uh, it's an interesting story how we got to know James when we issued our call for papers for volume two of uh, engagement studies. So, as you all know, here we had volume one uh, a couple of years ago, a special issue of philosophy and society, where we tried to basically lay the foundations for the emerging discipline of engagement studies. And this was a very tentative kind of exploratory collection of papers. And then this year, rather last year, we issued a call for a second collection of papers, which we hoped would expand upon the first one and really uh, present a, a more kind of comprehensive attempt to conceptualize and then apply the term engagement uh, across disciplinary boundaries in an attempt to uh, reach a more complex and nuanced understanding of political action, uh, domination, and prospects for social change today. So the title of the second volume was Engaging for Social Change. And we got some very interesting contributions uh, in response to our call, and one of these contributions was from, from James. And it was a, a paper titled Social and Political Change from Below, Norms, Practices and Mechanisms of Attunement. And when Sujan and I, the, or the editors, read this paper, we thought, amazing, there is someone who is doing exactly what we here are trying to do, even though we are mutually unaware of each other, right? So we thought it would be a great opportunity to, to invite James to present on whichever topic he finds of interest, it didn't have to be the one for the collection of papers, as we thought this is really how engagement studies should be done, and we think we have a lot to learn from James. So, James has been senior lecturer in contextual studies in the School of Communication Design at the University for the Creative Arts for three years, having previously worked at the University of East London. University of Westminster and Kingston University. Uh, James graduated from the University of East London with a PhD in Cultural Theory and Contemporary Philosophy. His work deals with issues relating to interactivity, rationalism, non-standard logic, and the relationship between creative practice and reasoning. He has been published in numerous journals, gallery catalogues, and design books, and he's currently working on a monograph on meaning, dialogue, and interactive logics entitled Meaning and Dialogue, forthcoming with Springer Press. And he told me he's also working on another monograph which deals with the kind of reconceptualizing neoliberalism in the case of the UK uh, from the 70s onward, or actually from the end of the empire onward, which is a bit earlier. So he's involved in two very interesting projects. In addition to written work, he explores issues of temporality, accelerationism, and the bounds of thought through visual art, and particularly film. And his works have been exhibited at the Tate Britain and the galleries Zero, Klein, and Coma in London. And today's lecture bears the title of Migration as Political <coughs> Movement, and this lecture is part of the project, broader project on reconfiguring and reconceptualizing neoliberalism and the, and the end of empire. I wouldn't want to take any more time from, from James, so James, please. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, so first, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be part of the, um, um, the book as well. The, the bio is a little bit out of date. Is it? A little bit. So the book, is, that book is out. Um, it's from the website. No, I know. I mean, it, there's bios all over the internet, right? So you have to write and have more or less relationship with your actual work. Um, so I guess, like, yeah, that book is done. So that project of kind of meaning, norms, reason um, is kind of done. And then I've been working since then on um, social norms, which is the stuff that you've seen, um, and particularly in relation to race, racialization, racial formation theory, and neoliberalism. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about today, primarily through a, an attempt to um, characterize um, neoliberalism through that, through that kind of lens, and then use that to start thinking about migration um, as a political movement. And 
uh, like you say, this is part of a broader project. I hope that the paper makes sense as a sort of standalone um, piece. I think it probably does, but there are certainly going to be places where I'm talking about things in broad strokes and like running over things that require more complexity. Um, but that's kind of the way things go with um, with giving a paper anyway, right? Um, okay, so let me just give you a little bit of background and then I'll, then I'll um, go over the argument of the paper. So when we talk about neoliberalism, we think about the neoliberal era, or we characterize the neoliberals, whoever they are, it's become fairly commonplace to say that these are largely consistent with um, things like neoclassical approaches to economy, globalist approaches to trade. So people like Wolfgang Streeck suggest that neoliberalism includes things like free trade agreements, global governance, commodification, competition of a new era of capitalist rationalization. And David Harvey argues that the neoliberal label signaled adherence to free market principles of neoclassical economy, economics, sorry, and that neoliberal doctrine was deeply opposed to state intervention. This is the kind of key thing I'd like to reconsider. Uh, so Harvey focuses, you know the story I'm sure, but Harvey focuses on the crisis of capital accumulation in the 1970s, particularly in the US. Um, and he argues that that brings about a project on behalf of the upper classes to protect themselves from political and economic annihilation. That project to, re to repair class power is embedded in policy by people like Pinochet, Volcker, Thatcher, and Reagan by retrenching the welfare state, demolishing labor movements. And this is marked by a fundamental transformation of the role of the state. This is on Harvey's um, account. So the withdrawal from social provision supposedly intervening only in moments where neoliberal order breaks down, so places where we need to repair markets, for example, or prevent challenges to capital accumulation or resolve social crises. Um, and this is summed up by Milton Friedman's famous statement, um, market good, government bad. Um, so it's supposed on that story then that neoliberalism was as Wendy Brown puts it, not inherently eth ethno-nationalist, authoritarian, or plutocratic. The rise of contemporary forms of nationalism then are uh, understood, as Harvey puts it, as profoundly antagonistic to the neoliberal agenda. So implicitly, the suggestion here is that for the most part, neoliberalism held nationalist and racially charged movements at bay whether, whether working as a civilizing force for its advocates or eviscerating the social domain altogether for its critics. But over the course of neoliberalism, the nation state has become the primary legal container. The rights of migrants, for example, subject to its increasingly stringent whims since the middle of the 20th century. So this is what I want to argue. These analyses um, have tended not to pay attention to the historical configuration of neoliberal states in both the global north and south against the backdrop of a fast decolonizing world. I'd like to rectify this first by briefly discussing how early advocates of neoliberalism sought to reshape the social world to protect their interests in the context of the end of empire. And as such, I think that the neoliberal state was from the outset constitutively reliant by the neoliberal state here, I mean the global north, the northern Atlantic, I'm talking about the US and the UK primarily. And I'm interested primarily as we go on to think about the UK, EU, and its relationship to Africa. Um, so this constitutively reliant on global inequality and protection of its social contract, which is racially grounded. So to support that claim, I want to argue that neoliberalism has been reliant on two interrelated strategies. The first, neo-colonial extraction, and the second, preemptive containment of, of migrants. Um, so concentrating on European-African relations, I then would like to draw on literature from migrant autonomy or autonomy of migration. Um, and suggests that this provides us with a way of reconceiving citizenship and thinking about the state, uh, the state at large. Um, so the state beyond the state. 
This, this gives us a kind of reconceptualization of neoliberalism that I'm going to finish by suggesting at least that it might give us a way of thinking about migratory citizenship as a kind of insurgent universality. This is to use Massimiliano Tomba's phrase, which expresses a political agency of human lives beyond the nation state. So kind of citizenship, which is an existence outside of um, the national political community. Right? So it's a claim to citizenship um, in, a, in a distinct form of political community. All right, so first of all, I want to think about why, like, why is it that I think that neoliberalism can't merely be characterized by things like internationalization, globalism, or neoclassical economics. So yeah, of course, it's the case that privatization, deregulation, financial and trade liberalization have been central uh, neoliberal doctrines. But if we look at the work of Philip Murawski, for example, it's argued at length that these were subordinate to an overarching strategy um, which was to, to uh, maneuver towards the social character of economic relations. For Murawski, it's this that characterizes the central shift from liberalism to neoliberalism. So classical liberalism sees markets as natural and benevolent entities with the nation states um, in the global north, at least, as a kind of night watchman over the economy. In contrast, um, as Michel Foucault argues, neoliberalism should not be confused with the slogan laissez-faire, because free markets are understood by neoliberals as constructed rather than natural entities. As such, they require constant vigilance and, and, and the making of markets um, rather than being this kind of natural phenomenon that will simply, uh, that simply requires to kind of state, the state backing off um, until, until monopolies arise and things like that. So this, this doesn't then require state rollback, but rather something like state repurposing. So that a strong state is actually required here both to produce and guarantee a stable market society. I think this line of thought becomes quite clear when we start to pay attention to the historical backdrop of a fast uh, decolonizing world at the start of neoliberalism and, for example, the beginning of this kind of arch neoliberal think tank, the Mont Pelerin Society. Um, the Mont Pelerin Society still exists. Um, this has begun in the uh, late 1940s um, and one of its key architects is Friedrich Hayek. Um, their statement of aims from 1947 says this, the central values of civilization are in danger. Even that most precious possession of Western man, freedom of thought and expression, is threatened by the spread of creeds, which claiming the privilege of tolerance when in the position of a minority, seek only to establish a position of power in which they can suppress and obliterate all views but their own. So the Mont Pelerin Society, the MPS, I'm going to call them for short. They're concerned to advocate then for the stabilization and protection of Western man against a possible redistribution of power over resources, culture, and civilization itself. Even invoking civilization in this moment and its necessary protection would, have, would bring sharply into the foreground that which is considered to be uncivil, barbaric, non-Western. Perhaps that's not unexpected, though, given that the central basis of power on which Western liberalism had been built was under threat of dissolution in the empire. Um, as Domenico Lusudu uh, articulates at length, liberalism and chattel slavery shared a twin birth. So contrary to this idea that Western revolutions in the 18th century indexed a shift towards a civilized and equitable citizenship for all, as he puts it, they were implicated in the creation of contexts for an expansion of, a ra of racialized domination. And Charles Mills argues that the liberal social contract was fundamentally racist, forming an implicit agreement amongst Europeans to main, maintain the ideals of white supremacy across the world. As he puts it, the racist exception has really been the rule. Neoliberalism 
sought not to do away with these foundations, but to reforge them in a different time. In an attempt to defend liberal cosmopolitanism, which would be grounded in a kind of neo-imperialism. The territorial nation state in this period becomes a privileged site of collective self-determination, both in the North and the South. I realize this dichotomy between global North and South is not ideal. I'm gonna use it for sake of ease, essentially. But um, just, I am aware of its problems. Um, so political community um, and sovereignty of the nation state becomes awarded to decolonizing nations. Often the fight for decolonization is fought on the grounds of um, sovereignty of the nation state. But that, that's done very little to undo extractive and exploitative um, relations of violence and disruption. So for example, the neoliberals noted the, as they put it, the unfortunate use of violence in opening up world markets but they recognized the, that they were required to achieve foreign investments and commercial exchange. The concept of the, kind of the continuation of an empire after empire then creates the possibility for global prosperity, just as it creates the conditions for cosmopolitan society in the wealthy West. Um, I think I'll skip some of this because I'm kind of repeating myself. So this is the basic argument. Um, roughly speaking, the universal freedom that neoliberalism promised was roughly split down the equator. Again, complexity, but. Hayek, for example, um, he continue, continuously uh, you know, argues that, that, he, that he, the, you know, the most important thing is, is freedom, it's the universal property. Um, and this is, this is part of his argument against socialism and communism and the kind of rule-based approach to government um, so that we require uh, an emphasis on the total absence of domination um, in order to make free and rational decisions in our local arena because we can't ever understand the complexities of the market, um, but we'll see the sort of spontaneous emergence of all market order through making these rational decisions, right? This is the basis for his understanding of neoliberal freedom. But when you look at his work, it's quite clear that that's not um, as universal as it first seems, and it's not a property which is awarded to people who are not already living in the global north. Um, so, for example, he states that um, these kinds of values that are required for market um, freedom to operate in the free market system are not transferable to non-Western countries, where he says suitable traditions do not prevail. He also argues that even through education or indoctrination, those values um, couldn't be instilled because ed education can't, as he puts it, sufficiently protect against the effects of new desires. You have this kind of I, this very stereotypical idea of the unruly savage, right? This is, this is a colonial stereotype. Um, and this coheres with a, quite a, a much longer tradition underlying accounts of the liberal subject. So writers like Denise Ferreira de Silva argues that, for example, the history of Western reason which constitutes our understanding of the modern European subject, effectively rendered a non-European inhabitant subject to the effects and power of reason, which can only subsist internally to European man. So the non-European is relegated to this domain of cause and effect, to that which is external to reason, and this in turn constitutes European whiteness as indigenous to reason. Difference and otherness are forced into these cultural hierarchies and the relationship between European and non-European cultures is figured as a kind of relationship between subjects and objects. So I think driven by anxieties by, uh, regarding the possible increasing power of the non-white world, also challenges to white supremacy within the US and the UK, um, so civil rights movements and things like that. Um, and post-war immigration, 
um, particularly in, in the UK. Early advocates of neoliberalism then seek to reshape the social world and attempt to protect their interests in this new context at the end of empire. So the neoliberal state here, I'm going to continue to make this argument, I think is constitutively reliant on this attempt to protect its social contract and the relationship of global inequality through two interrelated strategies, as I say, neocolonialism and preemptive containment. All right, so neocolonialism, what do we mean by this? So I'm, you know, I'm sure that a lot, a lot of this you're already aware of. But a lot of the decolonization um, movements were very hard fought, obviously. Um, and following them, in, uh, we've seen ongoing intervention in the global south, which has often been described, um, as Kamari Clark puts it, as a kind of capitalist plunder. Obviously, a lot of work has been done in this area, considering the role of states and corporations in the global south in relation to development, aid, and security. Um, much of this work has suggested that colonialism continues to shape the current configuration of interests manifested and violently enforced in the context of neoliberal global government. But often, whilst its after effects are considered, colonialism is still understood as something that was done by Europe to the global south, and now is just a remnant or legacy of empire that continues to influence the treatment of those people who are once colonized. In effect, that would reproduce a kind of methodological nationalism, but also a Eurocentrism, which is the, the kind of thing I was just mentioning about the idea of the European subject and the non-European objects, this one-way causal relationship. And this would also suggest that contemporary neoliberal forms of governance um, have been kind of endogenously produced in the global north rather than inherently tied to and made possible by transnational and explicitly colonial processes of accumulation, exploitation, and control. So that's the distinction I'd like to make here. So for example, there's a combination of military support for insurgencies and wars that happened particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, um, obviously in South America also. Um, so for example, um, there's, there's support from white South Africa and Rhodesia for insurgency in Mozambique, um, which, which devastated the ability of a newly founded communist government from um, putting in place infrastructure and things of this. So when, after decolonization, the, um, the government there quite quickly um, saw a bit like accelerating rates of education, literacy, um, infrastructure, technologies, and that which was absolutely devastated by civil war, um, funded primarily by white South Africans' religions. Right? So this happened a lot. Um, what that does is it then leads you towards um, a, a, a necessity to rely on Bretton Woods institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. Um, and this has been a kind of common story across the global south, right? So in the face of devastation, um, multilateral aid packages become necessary, even when, as Jim Gwenza quite um, I kind of uh, maybe controversially puts it, provides the foundations upon which the wholesale looting of developing countries um, occurs. So this involves things like structural adjustment programs, so SOPs, um, which were put, on, put in place as like a condition on lending in the 1980s, right? So what they did was, they, the, the conditions that effectively benefited political and economic institutions that sponsored those loans, that were awarded via the IMF and the, the World Bank, but the, the sponsor of the loans uh, was, was um, made by people like the US, Japan, Germany, France, uh, the UK. Um, and what this did was, was put in place a kind of regime of indebtedness, to, to draw on Lazzarato's uh, phrase. And so there's a kind of control that doesn't require you to default on those loans before you can have this kind of regime of uh, domination, but one which works through the conditions on the loans themselves. 
So those conditions um, were things were effectively things like um, a, re a massive reduction in public spending, um, the reprivatization of newly nationalized industry um, and healthcare systems and education systems, um, and, and opening up your natural resources to global markets. Um, so this combination of like financial liberalization and fiscal austerity, um, and also like reductions in subsidies on um, agriculture and industry and things like this. So that, that allowed access to the natural resources of the global south um, and ensured the privatization um, of industry and decrease in um, trade barriers. These conditions, which like I say, were often caused by support for military intervention and at times um, enforced by them. We've seen that, uh, like I was talking to you about mining in sub-Saharan Africa has often been uh, enforced land grabs, enforced land grabs via um, private armies that are funded by corporations from the US, with Canada actually one of the worst for, for being one of the supposedly most liberal countries as the worst track record in mining um, uh, violence. It's, there's, there's a report I was reading about this recently. Um, okay, and so this forms the basis of what Kwame and Krumer argues that aid, aid has been fundamental to neocolonialism in Africa. So, for example, SAP's structural adjustment has made way for land acquisition for extractive mega projects um, like gas fields, mining, agro industry. This is semi forced acceptance of aid, dismantled domestic authority. It led to the increased role of foreign investment, consultancy, NGOs in development, developing countries. So, the continuation of this kind of neo colonial extraction then um, is inextricable from direct involvement in global, uh, the Global South nations by global bodies and other. Um, uh, nation states from the global north. Um, so Nkrumah puts it, the essence of neocolonialism is that the state, which is sub, uh, the state which is subject to it is in theory independent and has all the outward trappings of international sovereignty, but in reality its economic system and thus its political policy is directed from the outside. All right. How much time do I have? Don't worry about that. Fine. What if people get bored? They might get bored. <laughs> they might be bored already. Um, okay, so the second strategy. Strategies of containment. Um, okay, so whilst there's been uh, much discretion of, uh, you know, a huge amount of literature on migration um, in past decades, this is often understood through, through the lens of neoclassical models of migration, which look at economics, demographics and think about migration in terms of a combined action of factors of push and pull, right? These have come under heavy criticism over recent years. So Sandra Mazadra puts it, the processes of exclusion, stigmatization and discrimination tend to figure in that framework as mere collateral effects of a capitalism and citizenship whose integrative code is not questioned but is rather considered as continuously reconstructed and reinforced by migration itself. We might also want to think, in addition to that, about climate refugees and the, the idea of um, extreme weather producing, having this like causal effect of producing climate uh, migration. So that kind of approach reduces analysis of migration to something like capitalist supply and demand, or again, like. Um, climate-caused refugees, or state policy um, and state violence and unrest. I'd like here to consider instead this in the context of neoliberal strategies of citizenship, and I'm going to concentrate primarily on the United Kingdom and its relationship against Africa and across the EU. In foreign policy, We've seen policies that make it all but impossible for migration from poor and non-EU countries, which contribute to massive increases in what is called irregular migration. This is undocumented migration, 
migration without um, a visa, uh, this, this, this kind of movement, which we've seen obviously, you know, through the Balkan corridor. So you're aware of this. This is the biggest, one of the largest migratory movements um, in recent years. Since the migrant crises, I don't know what, what how your uh, government here has depicted uh, migrant crises, but this is certainly how it's been depicted in the UK. Um, so since the migrant crises of the mid 2010s, the UK has vastly expanded its involvement in the militarization of borders, not only in the, in the country itself, but across Europe and across Northern Africa. So militarizing fortress Europe, as it's been called, in surrounding non-EU states, so places like Morocco, Turkey and Libya particularly, as gatekeepers by, by again using um, humanitarian aid in, in return for um, building uh, detention camps and things like this effectively, and, and uh, the return of migrants from Libya particularly, we've seen a lot of <coughs> problems. Um, so a key migratory route to Northern Africa, so preventing people from coming, getting into Europe in the first place. Also building prisons in Jamaica and Nigeria, which are, which are built sp specifically for migrants um, that the UK would like to deport to be home, homed in, uh, incarcerated in. Um, because the detention centers that, my, that irregular migrants are put in in the UK are overflowing. Um, the conditions that we keep um, irregular migrants in at the moment is they're pretty bad. Right? Um, as you're probably aware. Um, and und so, and under UN policy for the past 20 years or so, there's a there's a policy of uh, of. Uh, prevention of movement where refugees are at least attempted to be kept in their regions of origin. So whilst contemporary neo-colonialism neo leads people to pursue labor and life in other places and other regions, particularly in Europe, it's militarized policing of movement, hotspot programs, externalization of uh, bordering, pushes migrants towards more deadly routes or into detention. These practices don't simply attempt to prevent irregular movement um, into Europe. They make migrants irregular. They render migrants inherently illegal and criminal to be exploited to subsidize middle class populations, to be placed in indefinite detention or left to die in the Mediterranean Sea. This is manifest in the alliance of forces that enact military action to contain and control Africans, African people's ability to move, which, as Catherine Besterman puts it, in effect incarcerates them in zones of profound and enduring insecurity. So whilst thousands of people from sub-Saharan Africa attempt to make their way towards Europe each year, many become trapped within local areas, or the no Northern African buffer zone, where the EU has supported these detention centers and camps. The securitization and externalization of the policing of movement, which is perhaps most clear in the proposed plan to create disembarkation zones in exchange for finance and technology in Northern African countries. This has been opposed by leaders of African states the idea is that these platforms would immediately return migrants to their supposed country of origin. Projects in Niger and Libya particularly already support migration partnerships with countries like Nigeria and Ethiopia to assist this return. And aid to those countries is conditional on involvement with those projects. So, for, so what we see here is that the same kinds of processes that for example, make the global south more susceptible to changes in climate, so the dismantling of infrastructure, the inability to build um, nationalized projects and, and massive uh, you know, technological intervention and, and uh, adaptation to climate, things like that. Those processes of neocolonialism, 
that that intrication with post Bretton Woods institutions also makes way for the enforcement of the international refugee regime um, through the UN and other NGOs whose primary strategy is containment and pre prevention of movement. As of 2017, 30% of global refugees were detained within Sub-Saharan Africa. And that was part of what's called the European Union, African Union, United Nations Joint Programme. This intra-regional emigration in Sub-Saharan Africa is the largest South-South movement of people in the world. You can see, I mean, uh, to put it really bluntly, the neoliberal um, processes of, in, of intervention and extraction, which create things like um, the uh, susceptibility and vulnerability to things like uh, uh, eye dye in Mozambique recently, um, a similar, like, so this is the same, like the other side of the coin to the strategies that force people to be contained in place, keep those people in place, rather than moving as kind of climate refugees into, into Europe. Okay. So I, I'm hoping that then we can, whilst I, I realize that some of this is quite broad brush, um, that we can conclude that, that the nation state in the global south at least, during the neoliberal era has been broadly reliant on structural adjustment programs, the appropriation of land and resources, the making surplus of its people and uh, their containment. And meshed with big corporations and imperial powers, the nation state is required to ensure the smooth running of this kind of economic activity. Africa, as Mbembe argues, is not marginalized by neo-colonial practices so much as enmeshed within parallel economies of international scale. This is the kind of true neoliberal globalism, effectively. Um, this, together with the narrative um, that I've suggested, confounds that kind of simplistic neoliberal analysis then, and allows us to argue that European-African relations continue a colonial strategy of engulfment, to use um, Denise, de Sa Denise Ferreira de Silva's phrase. So that, the idea there is that we, it's not a relationship of, uh, of exclusion, um, it's a relationship of asymmetric inclusion. This is kind of important conceptual um, framing. So it operates beyond this binary of exclusion and, and inclusion, rather to foreground neo-colonial relations um, as residing with a tapestry, uh, a tapestry of transactions, regimes, and practices. So Africa as engulfed within transnational interconnections across the global north, but not as an equal partner. So the alienation of lands is inseparable from the attempted containment of people. Engulfment and containment then shaping these specific specificities of movement across transnational relationships that characterize EU-Africa relations. Human and natural resources are pulled towards the old metropole, continuing to produce and ratchet up global inequality and the effects of climate change. Whilst neo-colonial connections rely on an un unequal engulfment and subordination of the global south and propping up the mythological form of the nation state in the global north. So the idea of the territorially bounded nation state in the global north um, becomes quite clearly a kind of mythology which is required to continue these practices that is constitutively reliant on an unequal relationship across um, across the EU and, and Africa. Um, so there are ties that bind Africa to Europe, which I would like to suggest form some, if, form a way of thinking about political community which extends beyond a territorial nation state. There would be a transnational political community in which Africans and Europeans have an unequal right to determine their collective political fate. At present, at least. 
I'm going to try and bring these things together. Okay, so by thinking through these neoliberal strategies of neocolonialism and containment as producing the kind of neo, uh, uh, the kind of liberal cosmopolitanism enjoyed by many in the global north. I'd now like to argue that this relationship of transnational engulfment, inequality and injustice provides some support for radically rethinking migratory justice, and in particular thinking about these relationships across EU and Africa as forming a kind of neo-colonial political community um, through which we can understand migratory movements in a, in a slightly different way, and citizenship in a slightly different way. Um, to do this, I'm going to draw upon theories of the autonomy of migration, um, which I will call AM for short. Um, this is people like Nicolas de Genova, um, Sandro Mazadra, influenced a little by uh, Antonio Negri. Um, and in general, the approach emphasizes the autonomy of practices of movement in relation to their attempted control and regulation. So rather than that objective kind of push and pull, it looks at the production of um, citizenship, the production of the nation through bordering practices and focuses on the agency of migrants themselves. So it destabilizes, to some degree at least, the, the discourse of walls and fortresses, and it emphasizes the capacity of migrants to pass over borders with some difficulty, obviously, and also draws attention to the productive role of bordering technologies, not just to exclude people, but to differentially include. So rather than consider borders or migrants as such, we then can foreground practices of violence that constitute migrant subjects, illegal humans, imminent outsiders, and the nation state itself. As Sandro Mazadra puts it, this is not a unilateral process of exclusion and domination managed by state and law, but a tense and conflict-driven process in which subjective movements and struggles of migration are an active and fundamental force. So AM problematizes the distinction between the migrant and the refugee, for example. The latter, the refugee, is never purely a victim. The former, the migrant, often entangled in structural and physical violence, injustice, and poverty. This is Mazadra again. While refugees, asylum seekers, and undocumented labor migrants may well be pushed and pulled across borders by a range of external conditions, like persecution, poverty, disaster, conflict, demand for labor, their movement is also the result of subjective decision-making processes embedded in individual, family, and community strategies for survival and prosperity. In short, migration is a result of agency as much as force. So unauthorized journeys and existences within Europe by migrants from sub-Saharan Africa are thus an example of agency as much as coercion of planning, cunning, intellect, and strategy. And this reverberates across the global north, where the shift from colonial nation to neo-colonial nation state brought with it new relationships of geographical inclusion, in which irregular migrants and residents um, of, other, uh, of other nations become incorporated as economic participants whilst often being excluded from the political community or from social uh, cohesion, to use a kind of new labor, 90s liberal phrase. Um, as McNevin puts it, the strategies and technologies which define them, so their containment within informal economies, random policing which maintains them in positions of vulnerability, are also implicated in the making of insider citizens whose relative privilege now reflects specific practices made possible in and through global political economy. So the idea here is that the, role, the, the nature of the insider citizen, to use her phrase, is, con, is constitut constitutively dependent upon um, the kind of subjugation of 
those migrants who will always be seen as um, second-class citizens or um, kind of imminent, Im imminent outsiders, as McNevin puts it. So in the UK, for example, post-colonial labor migration policies um, after the Second World War created a hierarchy of citizenship for non-white migrants and white citizens. Labor put in place um, in 1968 a Commonwealth Immigrant Act and that limited migration to what was called patrials. Those people who could trace their family lineage back to Britain within two generations. So that meant that across the Commonwealth, the only places that, that was going to be possible were places like New Zealand, Australia, um, uh, the States. And not places like um, the Caribbean. Um, then subsequently in 1971 and 1981, we had acts that made migrant citizenship conditional on things like good behavior. And that also abolished birthright citizenship which means that you could be deported even if you were born in the country. Right? Simultaneously, differential citizenship in the UK was produced through these official policies of colour blindness. But these were run together with discourses legitimised through governments and education, things like cultural degeneracy, criminalisation, the pathologization of migrants, that would recoup and embed racial stratifications even after the official outlawing of racial discrimination in 1965. This indicates a shift from offering citizenship as a kind of category across remnants of empire to a regime of control. As Catherine Besterman puts it, it retained whiteness as a key factor in determining who would be allowed to cross borders and enforced the national conferral of citizenship as the only form of internationally recognized political belonging. So in the process then, the category of citizen is reproduced, not as a civil guardian of empire, grounded in racialized natural law, as it would be in the times of, of empire, but as locus for a kind of unequal democracy. Territorial borders are produced as political borders through practices of bordering and nationality acts, which naturalize the exclusion and hierarchical treatment of immigrant um, populations. Okay, and that kind of naturalization underlies quite a dominant view in um, democratic theory. So this is um, one which is fairly prevalent across um, political theory which brings together democratic theory with cultural nationalism and argues that the two together provide the basis for political community and citizenship. So a lot of political theory, um, particularly in the 90s and um, 2000s, turned around these kinds of issues. So people like um, Will Kimlicker, David Miller, um, James Tully, uh, Iris um, Young, this kind of... Um, so, for example, Will Kimlicker argues that a multicultural democratic politics necessarily includes diverse cultural groups. Um, he defines them as intergenerational communities, as he puts it, more or less institutionally complete, occupying a given territory or homeland, sharing a distinction, um, a language and history, and that the nation is a kind of macro collection of those groups. That forms an enabling condition for shared democratic values. This is a view also held by Yale Tamir. And um, David Miller, kind of, if they have this infight, but effectively within a very small circle, um, who argues that people are held together not merely by physical necessity, but by a dense web of customs, practices, implicit understandings in a national community. Um, where a case can be made for unconditional obligations to other members that arise simply by virtue of the fact that one has been born and raised in that particular community. So they, they essentially disagree about the role of multiculturalism in the, in the basis of, of a national political community. This is a very small circle which argues that um, the basis of uh, political community um, is you know, national cultures, polities, which provide the kind of only context 
um, for the values of freedom, equality, and democracy. Um, so David Miller, again, argues that, as he puts it, national identity provides the moral and juridical, juridical boundaries of citizenship by tying together the geographic base of the nation to the territorial base of the effective state. Right. Well, hopefully you can see how migrant autonomy literature kind of cuts right into this um, position. So against that kind of naturalization of national identity, migrant autonomy looks at the ways in which citizenship has, in, has rather been constituted through exclusion, hierarchical formation of non-citizens. So Engin Eisen, um, his work I'd highly recommend actually, this is really um, important on citizenship, um, argues that citizenship is a, is a dynamic institution of domination and, and, and empowerment that governs who citizens, subjects, and aliens are. Citizenship is not membership. It's a relation that governs the conduct of subject positions that constitute it. So for example, only by reference to the nation state and its citizens as bounded subjects, can we make sense of the idea of the irregular migrant. The two are brought together, brought into being together, through things like border securitization, neo-colonialism, and attempted containment. So citizenship on this approach is constituted through these acts, institutions, and systems that vastly overrun the legal and political domains of the territorial nation state. And acts of citizenship transform modes of being political, as Eisen puts it, um, bringing into being new actors as activist citizens, that is, claimants of rights, through creating or transforming sites and stretching scales. That's a quote from Eisen's work. The arguments that I've made um, today, or the kind of broad um, narrative that I'd like to tell about uh, neoliberalism, I hope are a way of stretching scales, as Eisen was putting it. They require us to consider European-African relations as forming a political community by means of interconnection rather than as territorial nation states. Where that interconnection is constitutively built on an unequal relationship explo and exploitation. And arguing that the neoliberal era has witnessed the strengthening of the nation state through these transnational relations of inequality across the global south, I've sought to show that there are available to us a different, at least possibly a different basis for political community, for rethinking what political community is, other than that of the nation, or this mythic liberal cosmopolitan. So in this light, migrant autonomy gives us a way of thinking through what Massimiliano Tomba calls insurgent universality. As he puts it, in insurgent universality, the human is the subject who, by acting as a citizen, albeit beyond one's legal status and the putative boundaries of citizenship, puts both the social and the political order into question. So acts of citizenship, like the migratory movement through the Balkan corridor, fall neither into the particularity of the territorialized nation state, nor into the supposed universality of the neoliberal cosmopolitan. Rather, they seek to account, they make us account possibly, for the specific socio-historical socio contexts of those acts that operate beyond both national and political representation. So in this sense, I think we can foreground not the demands of those who are excluded from the nation state to be included in it, which is a standard way of thinking about migrants, right? Claiming ref um, status of refugee, claiming, uh, you know, on the basis of, of uh, international law that, 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 that a state is required to admit um, in, in the case of um, possible torture and things like that, if you return, if you return. So not 
within that kind of um, discourse. So much as claims to citizen, citizenship that already exist within a broader political community, and thus claiming an equal right over their collective determination. Claiming an equal right over freedom of movement and claiming an equal right over uh, resources. The actions of migratory movements inherently exceed the container of the nation state. Particular and concrete individuals act in a specific situation, but one which is more universal than the juridical universalism of an abstract bearer of rights, where those rights are always marked and by the legal container of the nation state. So I've argued that the neoliberal nation state is to some degree a mythic entity um, whose transnational form is rather the exploitative neo-colonial state at large. And in this light, that we might follow Tomba's suggestion that, as he puts it, instead of claiming protection by state or supranational powers, insurgent, nat insurgent natural rights express the political agency of human beings beyond the state. So that is to say, and just to, to finish, that migrant movements such as those through the Balkan Corridor can be understood as a political movement operating beyond the nation, nation state, the territorial nation state, and as actors within an already existing political community um, that operates beyond state territory. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>